Happy Thursday, everybody. Um, here in scenic Wisconsin, I'm looking out the window. We're uh, finally getting some warm weather this week. And it, I was so excited. Um, maybe two days ago, I actually worked with the shop doors open because it was about 55 degrees outside. And depending on where you live, 55 degrees may not sound like much. But uh, as a point of reference, that makes it about 80 degrees warmer than it was three weeks ago because it was 30 below here, um, not about three weeks ago. So uh, in this part of the world, when you hit 55, that is a banner day. And, um, and it's funny too, like when this happens, um, in the fall, when you get to 40 or 50 degrees, you start putting on pants and a flannel shirt. In the spring, after 30 below temperatures, you're walking around in shorts and a t-shirt because it's it's all relative. Um, we'll jump into questions here. I know there are some listed already, um, but I wanted to point out uh, if you go down um, on WWGOA.com where you're watching there, if you scroll down just a little bit, you'll see a banner there that says all about beer, kind of like this. And what we did there is we compiled three different projects together, a couple of bottle openers and a grill caddy. And... Um, Everything is there, and when I say everything, so one of the things um, when I have editors contributing stuff, I didn't do any of these articles, they were all contributed, um, but we wanna make sure that the plans are complete. So for instance, on the grill caddy, I had it right in front of me a second ago, it has the full size, <laughs> I should have just got to that page, there we go. Full size pattern that you need, to trace onto the end. So um, so the plans are very complete. So bottom line is if you go click on that, it'll get you to where you need to go so that you can download the PDF. Pretty substantial. Um, this is 32 play pages of plans for those three projects. So have a look at that. Uh, Intrepid Katie is behind the scenes running the stuff so that we know we're broadcasting here. And I am going to look for preguntas. Oops. All right, Bob says, like to know if and when to use guide bushings on my router, or am I okay with just using the bearings on each bit? What's the difference? It's a good question. Um, guide bushings. So we can do a kind of a compare and contrast here. Let me, let me get a router bit, I'm not leaving you. Well, I am a little. And I'll warn you in advance, I'm gonna be dipping into the Gatorade every once in a while. I was uh, working wood all day and I'm just a little scratchy. Even though yes, I wear a respirator. Okay, here's what we've got. So on the left is a flush trim router bit. Let me get one more cutter now that I'm thinking about it. So to be more specific, that's a half inch diameter. <clears throat> there you can hear it already. Half inch diameter flush trim router bit. Let's see if that little guy will stand up for us. Yeah. And on the extreme right, that's a pattern style bit. The difference is the bearing is at the end of the cutter. That's a flush trim. The bearing is between the cutter and the shank. That's a pattern style bit. This is a guide bushing in the middle, or some people call that a template guide bushing. And this can go into the base of your router. What all of these achieve is giving you the ability to ride up against something like a pattern without the cutter digging in excessively. So in this case and in this case, the bearing on the bit is the exact same diameter as the cutter. The bearing is gonna ride an edge, like on a template, and then the cutter is gonna stick, or the cutter is gonna cut away anything that projects past that edge, past the template. In this case, the router bit is gonna come out through the center of this so I think this is probably a half inch diameter guide bushing. So you would use a smaller bit, maybe a three eighths inch diameter bit, would come through the guide bushing 
And then similarly, that guide bushing could ride on something so that the router bit doesn't have a chance to dig in. If you're using a dovetail jig, guide bushings are the most common solution for preventing uh, router bits on a dovetail jig from cutting into the comb, the template of the jig. For me, I use, my, my primary application of guide bushings is that, is dovetail jigs. I've got a couple jigs in here that, um, shop made jigs that I've made that take advantage of guide bushings. But one of the things you have to remember with this is doing math. So if I wanna use a guide bushing in companion with a template, I have to do some math and figure out if the bit diameter is 3 eighths and the guide bushing is half, how big do I make the template to end up with the right size part? Because the diameter of the cutter and the diameter of the guide bushing are not the same. With a flush trim or a pattern style, everything is, everything jives. So whether this is a half inch flush trim or a three quarter inch flush trim, the bearing and the bit always line up, same here. So whatever this traces, this is gonna cut exactly. So it just makes, um, a guide bushing makes making templates a little bit more cumbersome because you have to do that math to figure that out but it's not a horrible deal breaker. So at the end of the day, they all do similar things. If you've got guide bushings and, and you use them like this, you wouldn't have to necessarily go and get a flush trim router bit. Um, so they're, they are interchangeable in a lot of respects. Yes, I always have to make that noise when I zoom in or out. Just a thing. Okay, my iPad went to sleep. Now it's awake again. Brant, advice on how to clean the drive belt on a drum sander. Not the sandpaper, but the belt that pulls the wood under the drum. Yeah, so conveyor is what I would call that. So I'm, I'm looking at mine. Um, the conveyor on mine is kind of a rubbery material. It's almost like a router pad, router mat, but really, really thick. Um, and I just, I just run a shop vacuum over that on a regular basis. So even though I've got good dust collection on my drum sander, some amount of fine dust does fall down. And I find when it gets on top of that conveyor, I'm over time, not just a little bit of dust, but a lot of fine dust, um, that it, the material might start to slip on the conveyor. So what I do is I run the conveyor and then I just stand there with a vacuum, shop vacuum, and I allow the conveyor to come past the head on the back and clean it. If that's not enough, you could wipe it down with a solvent, but be careful so you don't melt it. You need a solvent, you need a cleaner that's mild. So denatured alcohol would most likely work. What I would always do is test on just the, you know, take some denatured alcohol and dab it on a rag and just on the very edge of the conveyor, wipe it and make sure you're not melting it. Um, don't use lacquer thinner. Lacquer thinner easily not melts like heat, but chemically melts a lot of different kinds of plastic. So lacquer thinner would be a bad choice. Mineral spirits would probably do it, but I often find mineral spirits to be kind of greasy and leave a residue behind. And then when you're running boards through there, you of course don't want a greasy surface because then the conveyor is not going to work and you don't want something on there some solvent left on there that's going to migrate into your board so denatured alcohol flashes dries very 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 quickly it's a great cleaner um, but i would try first just running a vacuum on it and use that to clean it and then from there try a little bit of um maybe a little bit of denatured alcohol John asks, thinking of purchasing a full-size lathe, like a 1642 for table legs and bowls. I'm a complete novice, need to know basic accessories needed from the start, chisels, chucks, and tool rest. Well, a tool rest will come with the lathe, so you're golden there. Um, chisels and chucks, um, I use a four jaw chuck on my lathe regularly for bowls. So um, some, I'm just grabbing it. 
Some people also call these scrolling chucks. Um, so different from the chuck I used in my tool machine shop days in that with these, all four jaws move at the same time. So you don't have to worry about centering. Um, it'll, it automatically does that. And then for chisels, what I would do, and Katie, if you wanna take a second and look on GOA for this, um, we have got, it's either an article or a video. I think it's a video called something like starter chisels for lathe. Um, I think I'm pretty close there. So if you can find that and just throw it in the chat roll, that would be cool with a capital K. Um, but what it's gonna come down to is skew, spindle gouge, bowl scraper and or bowl gouge, parting tool, that's a pretty good start. Mike says, if you purchased a 12 inch dovetail jig and wanna make a chest, say 18 or 24 inches deep, could you make two boxes and join them together or would the alignment of the two boxes be too difficult? Better to purchase a 24 inch jig, question mark. Um, so, you know, this is a pretty, I've seen this question before, not necessarily here, but I've been asked this question before. And this isn't something that I've ever tried. Um, I feel like the mechanics of this would be really, really, really difficult to do. So I, I've used a dovetail jig a lot and I'm, I'm pretty good at getting the material in in such a way that the parts line up and everything is doing what it's supposed to do. But even with that, sometimes where the, on the edges of the two pieces of the box come together, so this side and this side, there'll be just the tiniest of steps there. Um, so I think if you made a box and made a box and then the premise was to edge glue them together, that you would probably, it, it'd be hard to get that seamless. Um, a workaround for that would be turn, turn lemons into lemonade there. Um, where you have that seam, you could apply, you could surface apply a piece of trim, piece of molding that looks decorative, but in fact, what you're doing is covering that seam. At the end of the day, the last part of your question, better to get a 24 inch jig, question mark? Yes, um, because then you're gonna be able to do deep sides. Um, you know, you, you, can do, you can do 12 inch pieces on a 24 inch jig, and of course you can't do 24s on a 12. So if you wanna do the approach of like cry once and then forever have a, jig, a dovetail jig with a lot of capacity, the best approach would be get a 24 inch jig that'll let you do that stuff that you want to do. Okay. This like scrolled to its own little happy place. There we go. Doug is in Huntsville, Alabama. I bet it's warmer there than the 34 degrees we're having today. Mike asks, can you trust the size of a four foot by eight foot plywood sheet to be square? Or is it necessary to cut to square the sides? What's your recommendation for squaring the sheet before cutting project pieces? So first, no, um, don't trust them to be, don't trust plywood to be square. And then um, what I do is I start with a framing square. So sequence of events, you wanna work off of a good edge. So in most cases, if I'm to the point where I'm squaring a sheet of plywood, what I've already done is cut one edge straight, one long edge straight. So you could do that with a track saw or with a cirque saw with a guide, don't try to do it freehand. And then on my framing square, I have what are called stair gauges on it. That's these two guys. So those stair gauges fasten onto the square. And then when I put that, I'm gonna zoom you in. When I put that against the edge of the plywood, like it is on my bench there, because I always have to make that noise. When I put that up against the edge of my plywood, those gauges register. So I don't have to feel this is the square lined up. It basically, it's like, it's like having a big 
tri-square with a head on it, except the head is in the form of stair gauges. Then I draw a line as long as I can, which will be 24 inches. Then I'll take another good straight edge, like a four foot level, and extend that line all the way across. That's the cut line that then gets me perpendicular to this edge. And once you've got one square, now this is square. And once you've got that, then you can just keep working out from there. And then those cuts I do, um, I, those cuts I do with the track saw. So the track of the track saw would go on that now four foot long pencil line, make that cut. And then, like I said, now you've got two perpendicular edges and you can keep working out from there. So there's a lot of ways to do that. I mean, you can also put um, sliding tables onto a table saw that have enough capacity to square up bigger parts like that. Um, so there are many, many different ways to skin that cat. Mike asks, when milling rough lumber, what are the correct steps to follow? I've seen some joint to face and then an edge to that face on the joiner, followed by the thickness planer and table saw. I've also seen joint to face on the joiner, then planer, then jointer, finally table saw. So um, one, we've got um, squaring a board we've got on www.goa.com. So um, you could search that. And again, I'm pretty sure we have that in video form, not article form. And I think that as long as you keep track of what you've cut and what you have not cut, the sequence doesn't matter. So face jointing, you'll notice there is the first step in both cases. Um, I'm trying to think. For me, I think what I usually do, I do it so by rote that I don't really think about it anymore. I'm pretty sure I joint a face flat, then go to the planer, two parallel faces, then go back to the joiner, one reference edge, then go to the table saw, rip oversize, then come back to the table saw, joint to final width, and then you're um, then you have four squared perpendicular surfaces. But if you did joint, joint, again, as long as you keep track of what you've already done, it would actually be joint, joint. Um, as long as you keep track of which surfaces you've done, it's, it's, you're going to end up in the same spot. Karen asks, uh, so many questions and so little time. Um, I'm a novice woodworker, would like advice on basic tools. Bandsaw with a 12 inch resaw and dust collection advice. Yeah, so we don't, um, you know, statistical one, I've got a Laguna 14BX in here. It's a wonderful bandsaw. Um, we, we being WWGOA, don't do tool tests. A lot of companies or a lot of print publications do. Um, what I would do is look, you can Google um, bandsaw tool tests and see what's out there. And then you can get a nice side-by-side -side comparison of either by size and or by price. And that'll help you winnow it down to those two things to fit your category of tool. Brian asks, I made a tabletop out of two by six stud lumber, glue them together to make a panel about 52 by 36. After taking the clamps off, the panel was nice and straight and flat. Put it to the side for a few days while I made the rest of the cupboard. When I came back, it had cupped and twisted. What's the best way to fix this? I don't have a hand plane big enough and I don't have a drum sander or uh, planer or joiner big enough. Um, I, would, I would cut it all back apart. Um, so, well, let me see the size again. 52 by 36, so I'm assuming 52 is length, 36 is width. So you can do, you know, if you wanted to, um, you could, do winding sticks. So a winding stick, or a pair of winding sticks. Look like this. There's one, there's the other one. And look at there a little bit, they come to a little bit of a V on the edge. That's a 45 degree chamfer, leaving that little shoulder. So the way that you do this is 
when you've got a kerflui surface, you put the winding sticks on, and then you have to get your eyeball down here where you're on a level with the top of the sticks and you sight through them. And what you're doing is looking this way. And when this is flat, the tops of the winding sticks are parallel to each other. If as you sight through them, they look, this will be interesting. Whoops. If they look, boy, am I exaggerating here. But if they look like this, then that surface isn't flat. So what this would tell you is that this is a high point and or this is a high point. So from there, you know, if, if you want to try leveling the slab, you could um, go after the high spots with a belt sander or something like that. Um, it depends on how much out of flat the thing has become. You could also, I'm pretty sure we have a video on a um, shop made slab flattening jig. So um, you could, that uses a handheld router with a large diameter router bit in it. So imagine the slab is sitting on this bench. There's a rail and a rail, and then kind of a gantry that goes in between. Your router rides on that gantry, and that large diameter router bit is taken off the high spots. So the reason I jumped right away to cut it apart is if it's uber twisted, if it's, so let's say you started with inch and a half material, if it's three eighths high on one side, then it's three eighths low on the opposite side. You're going to take three quarters of an inch off to get it flat. So you're going to end up with a very thin top when you're done, which if that's what you want, that's cool. That's fine. But um, it could be better to cut it apart, flatten each individual piece, glue it back together. At the end of the day, um, part of what this comes down to, what it, a big part of this is that um, construction lumber, stuff that you'd get from a home center or a lumber yard is dried way differently than the material we would normally use for woodworking projects. Um, it's very commonly dried to maybe only 12 or 14% where the stuff we typically use for woodworking projects, if it's kiln dried, kiln dried, has been dried to six or eight percent, six to eight percent. Air dried, it's peaking out maybe around ten or twelve percent. So when you've got stuff that's wetter and you try to make furniture out of it, this is part of what we get. Part of the reaction is you get it in a shop environment. Um, it reacts like that. Reacts meaning it cups and twists and does all sorts of weird stuff. Um, so it's it can be very difficult to work with that way. But there's a couple options. Um, and then right below that, Katie's got the link for the beer bundle, which gets you the three plans that are included in this uh, 31 or 32 page plan set. So again, if you click on that, you can get that PDF for those. Um, Scott says, I have trouble balancing my bowl blanks prior to putting them on the lathe. It's hard to make a shopsmith turn slowly. Any tips for better balancing? Yeah, I think, if I remember right, low end on a shopsmith is 750. It's either 500 or 750. I think it's 750, which is not a very low low end for bowl turning. Um, yeah, you just got, I mean, cut them around on the bandsaw, and then you could put them on the shopsmith, turn it by hand to see how that looks, and then go back to the bandsaw and take off any high spots. Um, you can also use you can, you can put it on the shopsmith and then set up your tool rest with just a pencil on it, turn the bowl blank by hand, and with the pencil locked onto the tool rest, describe a circle on that bowl blank. Then, again, go back to the bandsaw again to cut that circle so that um, that should get you really, really, really close to round because you're marking it as it's mounted to the machine. Um, and that should give you a circle that's really concentric relative to your faceplate or chuck or whatever it is you use to mount it. So a um, couple solutions there, but that's what I did. I've turned lots and lots and lots of bowls on a shopsmith, um, but that was one of my biggest, I like turning green wood 
and that was one of my biggest frustrations is um, a shopsmith is not a very heavy machine and it doesn't have a low, low end. Uh, fastest, easiest, or no, shelf life on polyurethane. Yeah, I'm not sure. What I would do is just take your poly, look for the customer service number on your can um, or online for that manufacturer and give them a call. Um, I am not, I, I very rarely use polyurethane. So I don't, I don't know. Bruce says easiest and fastest way to cut mortises with a mortiser, dedicated mortiser is definitely the fastest. Barry says I have a benchtop bandsaw. Every time I use it, it wants to track to the right. I believe I have the guide dog set correctly and the foot all the way down on the wood. What's wrong? So don't, um, don't let the foot rub on the wood. So that's, it should be about an eighth inch. I mean, I've never seen a foot foot on a bandsaw like a scroll saw has. Um, so you want to have the upper guides about an eighth inch above your material when you're cutting. Um, then tracking to the right. So I would, I would check the blade and probably do a blade swap. So it can happen, um, and chainsaws do the same thing. If you dull a bandsaw blade or you dull a chainsaw chain um, and only one side of it gets dull, then the other side cuts more aggressively and it's very hard to cut straight with that. So what can happen on a bandsaw is um, if it's cutting to the right, maybe those teeth on the inside rubbed against a piece of metal inside the bandsaw and they got a little bit dull or you knocked a little bit of the set off of them. And if that happened, then um, that's part of what is, that's part of the, that, that is going to be part of the symptom is that um, it'll track, it'll, it'll cut more aggressively in one direction than the other. So that's the first thing I would check is the blade. Johnny says correlation between sandpaper grit and speed. Eh. In my practice, I don't think so. So the, the reason I vary speed is when I want to have more control and remove material at a slower rate. So as an example, um, if I'm running a belt sander, and, and I guess it doesn't matter 80, 120, 150 grit on the belt sander, I'll use a belt sander on a veneered material like plywood. But on plywood, when I'm doing that, so an example would be I'm sanding a piece of solid wood flush that I applied to the edge. I'm sanding that flush with the face. And that veneer face is about a 42nd of an inch thick. So, or a 24th of an inch thick. So um, I'll lower the speed on the belt sander so that I have greater control over it and I don't go through the veneer on the plywood. So I would treat it that way. And then, you know, by the time I'm, when I'm on a random orbit sander and I'm getting to a finer grit, I want that higher rotation, that higher speed to optimize the surface finish and reduce the scratches that I'm going to get. So um, I guess I would only do that. Um, I'm lowering the RPM more maybe in a roughing stage than I am a finishing stage. Um, but not something I've really thought about it. Um, Craig asked uh, the plans for the projects. So if you, here, I can just show you. Well, one, Katie put them in the chat roll here. So it's just a little bit up in the chat roll. But if on this page, there, I'm making that noise again. You scroll down just a little bit right there. Woodworking project bundle, all about beer. So we're, it's not really about beer. We're not teaching you how to make beer. We're teaching you about like summer stuff. A grill caddy and two bottle openers is what's in there. Ed asks, when doing a glue up, what's your preference, biscuits or just glue? Well, if I'm really hungry, I want biscuits and preferably biscuits and gravy with chicken fried steak. I have such a weakness for chicken fried steak. Um, so anyway, on a more serious note, um, if I'm just, if I'm doing an edge to edge glue up and it's 
I don't know, just a big old tabletop. Um, I'm probably just gonna do edge to edge. Now the qualifier to that is, if it's a large tabletop, then I'll maybe add biscuits, but to provide registration, not because I'm concerned about adding strength. So um, I, I attribute some of the biscuit use, um, the way biscuits gets used to Norm Abrams, because he was a very avid user of biscuits. Um, and I think as a result, people saw biscuit joiners get used and used and used and used, and they tend to put biscuits in everything. If you've got a good glue joint, edge to edge or otherwise, um, that joint is stronger, in, and you put glue in it, that joint is stronger than the surrounding wood. So my application for biscuits, like I was just saying, is primarily in a case where I've got two long pieces of wood, I'm gonna glue them up, and I wanna make sure that the tops stay aligned so that I don't have to do a boatload of leveling after the fact. And I use biscuits for registration. If we go back again to that concept of um, plywood, plywood shelf, with a solid wood cleat going on the front of it to stiffen it up, I'll use biscuits there to help make sure that those parts stay registered so that when I run my belt sander over there to level them up, I don't have to take a lot of material off. And the last thing you want is for the wood to end up below the veneer. So it's a registration thing. So um, small scale, if, if I can put something together without adding biscuits, I'm gonna do it because I don't wanna take the time and it's not necessary to take the time. Um, but if I need to add them for registration purposes, I do. Um, and then Katie got that link for you. So um, I'm not gonna scroll back up. Whoever was asking about um, the lathe chisels in the chat roll, Katie's got the link, uh, understanding a starter set of lathe chisels. So that'll speak to exactly what you were asking about on the lathe. Uh, best type of power planer for a small shop. Um, you mean a uh, power planer, like a handheld power planer? Um, I don't know about the best type. I've got two from Triton that I use heavily. One is a three inch cutter head and the other is a seven inch cutter head. So I use those. Um, I've been working with live edge slabs a lot. Um, I can show you kind of what's left of the collection. Over, where am I? Ooh, it's hard to do. There, big piece of Doug fir. There's a piece of hackberry. Um, so if I'm buying those rough, then I might start that preliminary leveling with a, that power planer. Um, so like I said, it's I've got those two models from Triton. And uh, which one I'm choosing depends on how big the slab is I'm working on. So again, not a tool test, a statistic of one. Um, but those Triton ones have served me well. Paul asks about a magnifying light for, light for a scroll saw. No idea. Um, I'm not a uh, I'm not a heavy scroll saw user. Um, so I, there are probably some wonderful products out there, but yeah, I don't know. Brian says working with birch finished plywood. After cutting it to size, I always have scratches on the finished sides. Don't want to sand it because I'm worried about sanding through the outside layer. Want to put a clear coat on it, how to fix. Yeah, so you, you need to know, um, you probably need to apply some more finish over the top of it because just handling is doing that scratching. So you need to know from the manufacturer what they put on to make sure that what you're going to put on is compatible. And I would think this has to be a common issue because, um, pre-finished sheet goods when they get handled in a shop are gonna get scratched. So I would check with the plywood manufacturer on what product they recommend for touching those up. And it's, it's probably something as simple as an aerosol can of A, B, or C, whatever A, B, or C product is, and, psh, 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 and you could touch those up. But it's, um, it's not a question I can answer because I don't know what the finish is. And if you put, Polyurethane over lacquer, it may not stick. Lacquer over polyurethane, it may not stick. Catalyzed lacquer, conversion varnish, lots of different products out there that it could be. 
Harold says, I need to make a block of wood eight inches wide. So I'm, I'm reading and thinking. Eight inches wide, six inches high, 18 inches long. Would the block be more stable if I laminated pieces of wood together or better if cut from a single piece? Yeah, glue it, glue it up. Gluing it up will make, give you a more stable piece. James says, when you build an upper kitchen cabinet from veneered plywood with a face frame, how do you disguise the sides that would be visible on the underside? Also, one side is visible. So I'll leave an extra quarter inch on the face frame to add a shaker style detail. How do you disguise the sides that would be visible on the underside? Well, you don't. I mean, you can, but most commonly people don't. Um, so kitchen uppers are typically 18 inches above kitchen lowers. So um, your kitchen lower is here, the kitchen upper is 18 inches above, which has the bottom of that cabinet way below line of sight. Um, so if you, if you walk through 100 kitchens, you'll probably see in 99 of them that it's just uh, underneath there, you're looking at the edge of melamine or plywood or MDF or whatever the core material is. But if you want to cover it, um, edge tape um, would be a great way to do that. Just apply an edge banding to that as um, to cover that bottom up. And you would want to do that, got to think a second, you'll want to compensate on the case side. So if, you're, if your upper is 30 inches, you'd want to cut the case side like 29 and three quarter apply the banding so it basically becomes integral to the um, plywood and then face frame on the front. Now the downside of that is you would have on the outside of that, on the last cabinet in the run, you're gonna have a veneered face here with a band going across the bottom. If you do edge tape, iron on edge tape, that stuff is as thin as veneer, like a 24th of an inch. So iron on edge tape would cover the plywood edge, um, but be nearly invisible from the side view where that's gonna show. So either one of those would give you a solution if you do wanna cover that up. Um, jumped again. Uh, David asks, with regard to tool sharpening, specifically lathe chisels, is there a specific type or method you find works best and is easy to use? Um, it depends. So for me, I, I do a fair bit of lathe turning. So my spindle tools, I primarily freehand sharpen on something like a work sharp, or a low RPM grinder, or um, well, those are my those are my two big devices. Um, and then my bowl gouges, which are fingernail style, you know, deep flute bowl gouges. I do those on a low RPM grinder with a jig. So um, we do have videos on GOA about sharpening lathe chisels. And what I, I don't think there's one great answer to that. There's what works for me but it has to be what works for you. And, and part of that is how much money are you willing to throw at the problem? So low R, a good low RPM grinder is not inexpensive. Um, I've got a low RPM grinder with CBN wheels on it. That was an expensive setup for me to get into, but it was worth it for me because I do so much turning and there are a lot of benefits to that. You can get a low RPM grinder and do aluminum oxide wheels. Um, and then there are guides like the Wolverine, the Kodiak, um, that'll help you um, act, they'll act as guides on those devices so that you're not freehand sharpening. Um, but again, you're, you're, you're buying knowledge there. You know what I mean? You're, you're, when you buy the jig, the knowledge you're buying is that every time I sharpen this lathe chisel, it's sharpened the same. That's important with turning because if you change the bevel, it's gonna change the way that you hold the tool. So for me with the freehand business, 
um, like, I got to think a second, what year is this, 2020? So like 30 years ago when I taught for ShopSmith, it was more than that, 34 years ago when I taught for ShopSmith and I was doing turning classes, six people in a class, immensely popular class, I had to sharpen all those lathe chisels. So I was sharpening whatever the number was, 30 or 40 lathe chisels every couple days freehand on a sharpener. Um, so I pretty quickly mastered that muscle memory. Um, that may or may not work for you. So again, what I would do, um, look on GOA for videos on sharpening lathe chisels or just content about that. And then look for the technique that goes with your approach. Um, and then also the, the sharpener itself. Um, I will say a work sharp is a very, very versatile device. Uh, you can sharpen lathe chisels, bench chisels, um, lots of stuff. Um, variety of grits available for it. Uh, so that's that's a good way to go um, because it's not, um, where a low RPM grinder is very dedicated to stuff like lathe chisels, something like a work sharp is capable of doing a lot of different stuff. Bruce says, 24 inch jig, question mark, too many joints to be feasible. I don't know what that means. 24 inch jig. I don't know. If you're still on, Bruce, um, I, need a, I need to be elucidated on your question. I don't know what you mean. Tom says, uh, in a video with the Prozzi tools, Yeah, so I answered this time by email the other day. Um, there's um, on a lock miter bit. Um, if I have one here, yep. Sorry for that loud noise. That was me blowing the dust off of the lock miter. I'm gonna do that. Sorry about that. I'm running into a connection issue with this camera. Okay. I don't wanna futz with the camera too much more because if I, Keep messing with it, I might lose that connection. Um, so, Tom, what, where I'm just looking for a pencil so I can point without my big fat finger going in there. There's a slot on the bit right there. And that probe on the device was going into that slot. Okay, hopefully I can zoom out and reset. William says on his jet jointer, there's a black plastic piece on the fence just left of the knives. At times my piece hits the back edge of the plastic and sticks as the plastic is slightly depressed. Why is this plastic piece? I think I'm just looking at my Laguna to see if it has one and I think it does. Yeah. so. I think it's just, um, I don't think it's uncommon. Ooh, now I'm gun shy about spinning my, we'll try it here. Hopefully I don't. Um, so if I do this, if, oh, shoot. All right, we're not going to do that. Not... All right, sorry about that. Um, I did, Katie, point that out when the video crew was here the other day, so hopefully that's going to get taken care of. Um, so on a jointer fence, plastic component is a glide so that the cast iron fence 
is not dragging back and forth on the cast iron bed of the machine. So um, if it's not um, lined up right, um, then that's a powermatic question, what the problem is with it. Um, but that's what it's, um, that's what that's, that's why it's there is so that it's just like on a table saw fence, there's a little, um, typically a high molecular weight plastic piece on the bottom of a table saw fence that helps it move without dragging. Um, so it's the same thing on the jointer. Uh, William says, can you explain how to remove the sandpaper on a disc sander? So on mine, um, I've had great luck lately with peeling it off and I don't. So then he goes on to say, how do you heat it? So I don't, if it sticks and if I leave, if it leaves residue on there, then I use a solvent like, um, denatured alcohol or something like that to clean that junk off. I don't use a heat gun. Uh, and then he goes on to ask, is there a way to have hook and loop for the sandpaper so you don't have to stick it on and off? Um, so there is. So again, back to my shopsmith days, um, I used to have for the shopsmith disc sander, I had a hook and loop system. So just Google um, whatever size sander you have. Um, hang on, there's a sneeze hiding in there. Okay. Um Google whatever size sander you have, hook and loop, and see what's out there. Um, what I don't like about that is it's squishy. So if you're trying to sand a crisp edge onto something, when you have hook and loop, it tends to kind of wrap around whatever you're sanding, and you can't get that crisp edge. So that's why I have not converted mine to that. I got to do this. And then I'm going to mention again, we've got that free download for you. So on the page here on www.goa.com, where you're watching and participating with the video, and thank you for doing that. Um, if you scroll down toward the bottom, there's a banner that says um, all about beer. And if you click on that, we've got this 32-page project packet for you. Uh, there's three projects in there, the plans, the how-to, photography, everything you need for those three projects. All right. Brian says, you don't use poly. What do you use? Um, my, my number one finish is a water-based, um, either water-based lacquer or water-based um, polyurethane called Aquathane. Aqua Coat is the manufacturer. And the lacquer I use is cross water-based cross-link lacquer. Um, Brian says, besides boxwood, another wood to cut threads. I've had a bit of success with purple heart. I'm looking for a more common wood I can find more easily. Well, I would think, I'm, I don't really know what you mean by cutting threads. Um, but it's, I think it's just got to be a closed-grained wood. So maple, cherry, walnut would be good choices. Not red oak because it's too porous. Not anything soft like pine or cedar. Um, so any a closed-grained hardwood would be what you're looking for. When you first started out as a carpenter, did you have a large shop? Nope. I, I had barely a one car garage. Uh, so again, by Shopsmith is the topic du jour. Um, when I when I was first getting started, I had one Shopsmith um, and it was, it was a one car garage in an older, like a 1950s house. So it was like, you could barely fit a car in there, much less a car in a shop. So it was one or the other. The Shopsmith was rolled against the wall when the uh, Ford Maverick was parked in there. Um, and then when I wanted to work, the car came out, I could roll out the shopsmith, do what I was doing and go to work. Um, preferred method to dry green bowls, put them in a paper bag with shavings and then, um, give them time a few months. Um, I don't 
for the most part, I turn my greenwood start to finish in one fell swoop. My friend Paul turns them rough. So using that 10% rule, wall thickness, 10% of the diameter, um, he then puts them in a paper bag and lets them dry. But um, more generally when I turn green wood, I, I start with it green and I take it right through the bowl turning process, start to finish in one fell swoop. And then I'll just kind of let it sit. See that shelf right there? Um, that's full of bowls. So I'll just let it sit in my shop for a while to make sure it's not going to do anything weird, um, like blow up um, or crack so badly that it can't be used. And it, it very, very rarely does. Steve asked for live edge wood. Should the bark be removed or just loose parts of it? I plan on putting epoxy coat over the top to make a small table. So here's my approach. If there's bark on a slab, um, the first thing I'll do is grab the bark with my hands and just wiggle it. And I'm not making an effort to break it off, but I'm seeing if, you know, like a loose tooth, is it going to come off of its own volition? So then from there, there's an it depends. Um, if part of the bark comes off on an edge and part has stayed on, does that look okay? So maybe this bark is still plenty solid. Um, do I want to leave that and somehow transition it to where the bark came off completely? Maybe, you know, is that, that's, that's an aesthetic is all it is. Um, if, it, if it stays stuck, um, then the it depends is how are you using the table? So I just recently finished a live edge table for my middle kid and it was walnut and walnut bark is fairly um, textured. So I didn't want to leave a heavy texture on there because this is a table you're going to sit at. So, you know, you sit at the kitchen table, you put your elbows on, you kind of lean against the edge. I didn't want there to be a sharp bark edge on there. So the bark was stuck stayed stuck successfully, but I used a random orbit sander and I eased it. So I took the sharp edges off the bark. Um, so it, if, if it's staying stuck, you're, you can sure leave it on. Um, if it's starting to flake off, then I just take it off. You know, if it's loose, I remove it. If it's partially on, partially off, aesthetic decision, you want to feather them together. And then, um, the other aesthetic is just if it's, uh, I did I did a table in Bur Oak. Um, Bur Oak has got a crazy textured bark to it. Look it up on the interwebs. Um, it's a it's a very, very deep, very text, very deep texture to it. The bark was stuck. I left that on because in that table's application, having that coarse bark around the outside was a good aesthetic, not a bad thing. So there's a lot of, it depends there. Jim says, oh, is there a router bit I can use to remove an eighth inch along the edge of wood? Well, probably, are you, like if you're trying to make the wood an eighth inch narrower, like a jointer, then I would do that um, probably on a router table in multiple, set up a router table like a jointer and do it in multiple passes. Um, and, um, we've got content on WWGOA about setting up your router table, like a jointer. And you could do that with a half inch diameter bit, a three quarter inch diameter bit. Again, the key is you've got to have that set up on your router table to allow it. Um, and again, using your table, like a joiner. Do you have videos on how to make a large, um, Finger joints on the Porter cable jig. No, we don't. We have not done that. I'm running reclaimed redwood through a grizzly spiral head planer. Final coat finish is not nearly as smooth as it was at the first cut. Could this be a result of cutting too thin? Yeah, maybe. So what can happen, um, you know, you think about the way a cutter head cuts, it's lifting. So there is a, there's a low end limit on how thin a piece you can successfully plane on a planer. 
because it gets to where when the wood is plenty thick, it's got enough rigidity to it that it'll pass under the cutter head and resist that the cutter head is uplifting like this because it's cutting, the, the wood's feeding this way and it's cutting this in this direction. Um, so when the wood is rigid, it's gonna resist that tendency to uplift from the cutter head. But as it gets thinner and thinner and thinner, the cutter head is doing this and it wants to lift up. And sometimes you'll hear that kind of as it goes under the cutter head, that's bad. That chatter is bad. So yeah, if you're if you're playing in real thin, um, it could be that um, that you're getting chatter in it from planing it thin. Ed says uh, biscuits for registration or to go to with chicken and gravy. Um, what about loose tenons like the Domino? So yeah, I use um, I use the Domino all the time, and that is structural. So for me, the Domino is a mortise and tenon replacement. Um, and then also um, reinforcement. So an, an example there would be, um, my brain is spinning faster than I can talk. That's why I'm stumbling so much. Um, an application for that would be if you do a waterfall edge on a table um, in order to reinforce, something's got to go in there to reinforce that miter. So that would be a good spot for biscuits or a festool domino or dowels or something, but you got to have something in that water and the miter on that waterfall edge. Um, so yeah, I do. I use a domino structurally biscuits primarily for registration. Does GOA have anything about shelves trimmed with crown molding? No. Jason asks, I've got a self-centering dowel jig, used it to joint five and three quarter oak boards for a TV tray table. The boards came together in a step-like manner where every board is higher than the other. How? Something didn't center. Yeah, I don't know. So somewhere, somewhere the self-centering didn't self-center. Um, I would just take your jig on a board and clamp it on. So put it on the board, tighten it. It should center, drill one hole, loosen it, pick it up, turn it 180 degrees and drill another hole, tighten it and drill another hole really close to the first one and see if they align. So maybe there's an issue with the jig where it's it's called self-centered, but it's not. But that's how I would check it. Uh, where are we at? Exactly five o'clock. One more question. Um, as a relatively new woodworker, how important is a table saw? Can I get by with a miter saw, band saw, and circular saw instead? Maybe yes. So it, these tool questions are always so dependent on what a person is going to do and what your budget is and how many workarounds you're willing to do. So um, you can get really good straight edges that use a, that are companions to a conventional circ saw. So you don't have to get a track saw. You can do some of the stuff a table saw would do. You're not gonna be able to do everything a table saw would do. So um, yes, you can, you can work around for a long time with um, the tools you're describing there. And then as your um, woodworking grows and your project directions grow, then your tool collection can also grow. And um, you can do more and more and more and more. All right, five o'clock. A um, lot of people watching, a lot of great questions. That was really, really good. That makes my hour go by so crazy fast. Um, this is March. See you again for this in April. And then don't forget, we also do a Facebook Live every other Thursday, um, oddly enough, on Facebook. That's at 11 o'clock in the morning, Central Time, on the WWGOA Facebook page. So the next one would be a week from today, and then it's, it's every two weeks on that schedule. So Katie, take us out, and uh, thanks, folks. We'll see you next time.